So I want us to look at this text, not from the Bible, and I want, us to, I want you to tell me whose phone is this? By reading this text, whose phone is this? So someone said it's the mom. So if you say this is the mom's phone, raise your hand. All right, put your hand down. If I heard the daughter, if someone thinks it's the daughter's, put your hand up. All right, put your hand down. If someone thinks it is the son, put your hand up. All right, put your hand down. If someone thinks it's the husband, put your hand up. And put your hand down. All right, cool. So here's the thing. We can look at this piece of technology and we can decipher some things. So right now we're trying to say who wrote this, who started the text, or or, sorry, whose phone is this, who received the text. And it looks like, it looks like it's the child of a parent. Am I right? Now, some of us want to presume some things and say it's the daughter or it's the son. We don't know that, but we do know a mom's involved, right? So, Because the text is gray, did they send it or receive it? They they received it, right? Right. And because it's blue on this side, whose phone is this? This is mom's phone. All right? So this is mom's phone. Mom gets a text from child saying, love you, mommy. And then mom responds, what happened? Child responds, oh, can I just love you sometimes? Mom knows better and says, are you in trouble? And then child responds, wow, just wanted to say I love you, thanks. So real quick, through analysis, you simply looked at a piece of technology and you were able to tell who wrote it and who received it. That also is how historians take manuscripts and they look at what the author wrote and said, now who is this intended for? Who did they write this to? And that's how we get all of our ancient manuscripts, including the manuscripts in your Bible. But wait, there's one more thing. Here's what I want to know. How can we know that we can trust what is written? Obviously, we know it was written, right? People didn't just fabricate this and make it up. Like, there's copies upon copies upon copies. Because back in the day, you would write this stuff down. But technology back then, we have phones now. Technology back then was pen and paper. Like back in the day, you got that, you got that iPhone 1, right? You got that pen 1, you got that papyrus 2, right? So they would write things down, but in some cases it may fade over time, so they would need to make another copy before it went bad. Just like before you get a new phone, you need to back up your stuff so you don't lose it when you get the new one, right? So this was their technology. So they would grab these manuscripts, they would copy them and all that uh, kind of stuff, but then... I know that it was written. Now I want to know, can I trust what is written? And so here's my question I want us to end with tonight as we, um, I'm going to like now start the devotion. It actually begins right now, and then we'll we'll close. It's real quick for you tonight. I just wanted you guys to go through the process of what historians do to validate any manuscript and prove to you and show you that the Bible, your manuscripts in your Bible pass all of these tests with gusto, all right? If you don't know what that means, (laughs) you need a translator, Okay. Uh, but here we go. Human nature, tell me if I'm right or wrong, is it human nature that when I'm telling a story that involves me, do I try to make myself look good or bad? I'm the hero in every story I tell, right? Just like when you go to tell your parents, like if you got into a little bit of trouble at school, you're going to paint a different kind of picture when you get home to say, but mom, here's what happened. I was trying to do my work. Meanwhile, looking at (laughs) so many missing assignments, I was trying to make up my work, right? We tend, as human nature, we want to make ourselves look good. So is it safe to say that if I'm reading your text, I'm reading your text, and it has some embarrassing stuff in there that that you put, can I trust it? I think you can, because you're not going to just make up a lie about how embarrassing something happened to you, right? So, for example, you don't wake up in the morning, get your phone out, and go to Snapchat or Instagram and say, here's the real me, y'all. No, you go and you get yourself together, you get like some drip, right, so that you can have W Riz when you post it, and hopefully it will be unspoken Riz. I'm just trying to be relevant in 2023, right? You would do those things because you don't want to look bad. It's human nature. We don't want to look bad. 
So here's my question to you as we go into Scripture. If that's true, you don't want to make yourself look bad, then why is it that so many times in Scripture the disciples look bad? There are some embarrassing stories about the disciples in Scripture. For example, if I'm making up a story about Jesus and I'm trying to prove to everybody that he, he was resurrected and he, he told us in advance that he was going to be resurrected, then guess what? I'm going to be the guy outside the tomb at daybreak saying, 10, not, and it was only me. It was just me by myself. None of the other disciples, you, uh, Thomas was locked in a room, scared, talking about, I want to see Jesus' scars. Like all these things uh, and how they fell asleep when Jesus said, hey, could you step and, and pray for me? Jesus, the Messiah, asked you to pray for him and with him, and you fall asleep? That's pretty embarrassing. How about this? Peter gets out of a boat in faith. That's a cool story. And then sinks because of lack of faith. That's not a cool story. But it's in there. So I want to go to a particular passage, and it's just three verses, and Mark chapter 8, and so some quick history for you, is that Jesus was born in zero, right? And obviously, yeah, too much detail. Okay, he was born in zero. Let's leave it at that. Died in 33. That's when he was executed. And at about 60, between uh, this particular manuscript we're about to read, Mark, is dated to have been written between 60 and 70 A.D. So that means it was written within 30 years of Jesus being executed and resurrected. So just real quick, if you... Do you think it's hard to remember something that happened 30 years ago? You do? All right, cool. Uh, leave your hand up if uh, you have a parent who was alive and, and still, the, obviously, and I'm not trying to get on a sore subject, but uh, is alive that you can talk to after this and say, mom or dad, whoever that parent is, can you tell me what happened on September 11, 2001? Right, so you, you can go to it. Just keep your hand up if you have a parent you can go to. Okay, cool. Now, leave your hand up if you think they can give you a good account of what happened that day. Awesome. That was about 20 years ago. So now go ahead and put your hand down. So I think it's safe to say that we can remember big events that happened even if it was 30 years ago. So here's what we need to know. We have some characters in play, just like we had mom and then child. We don't know if it was son or daughter. We have mom and child involved in that illustration. Here we have Mark who wrote it but he was writing what Peter told him to write. So I want to now test, can I trust this? I want to know, were Peter and Mark, did they even know each other? Were they alive during the same time? So I want to go to history and find out, and here's what we find out actually, is that Peter was born in 1 AD. So he's one year younger than Jesus. Peter is believed to have been executed between 64 and 68. More on that later. Mark was born in 12 AD, so he was a little younger. So uh, translation, he could type in text. He understood technology a little bit better, okay? So Peter tells Mark what to write down. Mark was not executed until 68, okay? So they lived during the same time period. So that, that checks the box. So we, we can agree with that. And tradition has it that Peter told Mark what to write down, okay? And we're about to read it. Here's a little bit of history for you that you've probably learned about in your world history class. Does anyone remember hearing about a great fire that happened in Rome? Yeah. Does anyone remember off the top of your head when that fire took place? July of 64. July of 64. Does anyone know who the emperor was during that fire? Nero. Nero was the emperor during that time. After that fire, he blamed the Christians for starting the fire. Now, there's no proof of that, that they started it. They say Nero started it, and some believe that he did some very questionable things, that he, this was one of those questionable things, that he started the fire because he had already put a plan together that he wanted to build some buildings and a new palace and everything uh, larger in the city uh, to make it even more beautiful and grand. That's how kings kind of did things. So it's believed that he may have burned the city so that he could build all of that stuff. And he happened to be out of town the night of the fire, and he never came back to town until he heard that it was about to approach his palace. Now, after that, it's believed through history and tradition, that he then opened up the grounds that he had available for the homeless where their houses burned down and said, hey, come live here. And he started blaming the Christians because Christians were a minority at the time back in 64. Interesting. So 
you have this battle going on between both of them, but it was at 64 that Nero then started persecuting Christians for, allegedly, what they did with the Roman fire. He's accusing them. They're saying, we didn't do it. And also, something you should know from geology and just location is that uh, just wildfires in that region were not uncommon. So it could have been neither, but they started blaming each other. Josh, why is this important? Here's why. Peter told Mark what to write down. But if you look at the Gospels, Mark's account is super short. Like, it's, it's really fast. You could read it, like, really quickly compared to the other ones. It just flies through and highlights the big, important details. It's kind of like showing up to the part, like, hey, just wanted to say this real quick and then getting out. Why that's a big deal is that it's believed that Peter goes to Mark and says, hey, write this down because I think I'm going to be killed soon. This was written between, like, 60s and 70s. And Peter was arrested. He was one of the first persecuted after that fire. And it's believed he was arrested then shortly after, I think, three months after the fire, and then killed somewhere between 64 and 68. Mark was killed during 68. So why is that a big deal? How would you have someone write something down for you if you said, hey, I want to make sure people remember this story? I'm going out. I think this is the last time I'm going to get to address the public. I think this is how people are going to remember me. So as a human, we would probably want to paint ourselves as really good. I can't believe Nero. I can't believe he would do that. He's such a mean guy. But I was brave and courageous. But he also talks about how he cussed out a middle school girl to say, I don't know Jesus and denied knowing Jesus. That's embarrassing. But perhaps one of the most embarrassing things is what he told Mark to write down. And also what he told Mark to leave out. He didn't share this with Mark, and Mark didn't write it down. Let's go to your passage. It's Mark chapter 8, verse 31. And this title is called, That's Embarrassing. So uh, if you want to take some notes to remember this conversation. But Mark chapter 8, verse 31, he then, this is Jesus, uh, he had already like been walking to the next village. And he says, hey, who do people say I am? And they gave all these names. And he says, who do you say I am? And Peter, Peter was like bold, right? Peter says, you are the Messiah. And you know what happens next? Jesus gives Peter the biggest compliment, but we don't have that in Mark's account. Matthew tells us, because he was there, but Peter didn't tell Mark to write this boastful, like, good compliment down. And this is where Jesus said, my Father in heaven had to tell you that. Your name is Simon, but I'm going to call you Peter, because on this rock, Peter, that's Petros means rock, on this rock, I will build my church. That's a huge compliment. Like Jesus is saying, hey, I'm going to do this on you, all right? Me and you, are. we got to knock this out. That's a huge compliment. But Peter doesn't tell Mark to write that down, and I believe verse 33 tells us why here in a little bit, but check it out. So verse 31, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. He is telling them, I'm going to be executed. This would be like if you had a favorite presidential candidate and the election's coming up in November, and you say, oh, he's getting so much momentum, that president is certainly going to win, and then he comes and says, actually, I'm going to go to Washington, D.C. in October, and Congress is going to have me arrested, and the Supreme Court is going to have me executed. Is essentially what Jesus is saying right here, because the Messiah was believed to be the leader that was going to put Judaism on top, and the Romans would bow down to them, and we would be the people, Right? But here's what Jesus says. I'm going to go and suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. So just real quick, Jesus tells him this before he is ever executed, that I'm going to die and come back. So my question is, why did no one write themselves into the story and say, that's why I was the only one outside the tomb that night, waiting? That would have been a great time to boast about yourself, unless it didn't happen, and you're trying to give a historic, accurate account. Then you got to leave it out. But what I don't understand is why Peter would tell Mark what happened next and leave it in. Check this out, verse 32. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside. He grabbed Jesus. Jesus, get over here. And began to rebuke Jesus. I don't always make good decisions, but rebuking Jesus has to be a bad decision. That's pretty embarrassing. The the guy that you're trying to tell everyone you should believe in as the Messiah, you pulled him aside and rebuked him. 
And here's how he responds, and this is why I don't understand why Peter would leave this in and take out the good news, how Jesus tried to compliment him. But check this out, the last verse for you. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. He's been called a lot of names in a short time span. He went from Simon, his given name, to Peter, Petros, Rock, because I'm going to build my church on you, big compliment, leaves out that name and says he called me Satan, which means accuser, opposer, opposition, because you're trying to get in the way of God's will. Why would you leave that in there unless it was actually true? He goes on to say, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. That passage right there, among many others, proves the validity of what the disciples experienced and that it is true what they wrote down. Because otherwise, you would have made yourself look a lot better. You would have said, I was outside the tomb. He called me this. He said he's going to build the church on me, and that's what I am doing. But if you're about to be executed, if you're about to be arrested, if you think that it's all coming to an end and you want to go ahead and you've been serving and doing all these things to build the church and now you realize the emperor is about to have you arrested and killed, you're not worried about human concerns anymore. You're worried about godly concerns. And that's why Peter, in my mind, said, no, we can leave out the how he like talk good about me, take that out. I don't care about that. I want to make sure that everyone reading this is looking to Jesus. So that's the validity and the history part for you. Now let me give you the life application. First off, you can trust your manuscript. You can trust the scripture. But let's get real. You know what I find scary and embarrassing? Is the fact that like Peter, we could be in the presence of Jesus and Satan can still use us to get in God's way. That scares me. You could still come to church and do some things and say some things that get in God's way that stop God's will. You don't have to be demon-possessed to still facilitate uh, the devil's will. So let me close with this right here. So if you stop paying attention at some point, lean into this. I'm going to sit. I'm not going to sit down. The camera's already good. Can I sit down and be okay? Let me get it kind of eye level. Is it possible that the devil doesn't like me being a Christian, but he's okay with it as long as I don't tell anyone about it? As long as I find my faith embarrassing, as long as I don't want to bring it up to anyone because I'm afraid I may offend them, even though it's how you bring it up, I don't want to tell anyone about it. As long as I'm too embarrassed to talk about my faith, I think the devil's going to be just fine with you being a Christian as long as you don't tell anyone about it, which is why Jesus tells us before he goes back into heaven, go to every nation and teach them what I taught you. Make disciples, baptize them. I think that it's scary that I could be working for the devil and posing as a Christian. And I also think it's super embarrassing that I could get in Jesus' way of reaching people because I'm concerned with human concerns. My health, my wealth, what people think of me, and less concerned about what people think of him. So how often... Have you been in school and had an opportunity to talk about Jesus, to help someone who's going through a difficult time, say, hey, can I tell you about Jesus? Or, hey, come sit with me on a Wednesday. But when you went to do it, you, you just, ah, I'm too embarrassed. Really embarrassed. The disciples worked through embarrassment. They talked about their embarrassment because of what was true. Jesus was true, so they stopped caring what people thought of them, and they put it in history. And said, don't think about how great and bold I was. Think about how great our God is and how he loves everybody. He wants everyone to know how much he loves them. So you have to tell them. So are you going to be too embarrassed over the next seven days to try to find one of these empty seats to invite a friend to? Because that's what Jesus wants. But if if you're too embarrassed, that's what the devil wants. So I want to encourage you. I want to give you... The, the go-ahead. I want to I commission you to please go to friends, to family, and find one of these empty seats that next week you can say, hey, will you come sit with me? We're going to eat some nachos. We're going to watch Nacho Libre. 
come dress to celebrate Cinco de Mayo. But most importantly, we're going to hear a message about Jesus. And he really loves you and he really cares for you, despite what may be happening in the world around you. And that's what I want you to know. So squad, please don't be embarrassed. Please be challenged. And don't let your embarrassment get in the way. Hey, I'm Josh Carter. Thank you so much for stopping by to view this message. If your next step is to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, we are so excited for you and we want to help you take that next step. So jump in the description and click those links to find out what following Jesus is all about, what that means, and of course, what's next. And if your next step is baptism, we would love to schedule that for you. So just go to crosspoint.church, select next steps, and get baptized. And fill out that application, and we will schedule that day with you. So super excited for you. But again, thank you so much for viewing this week's message. Have a great day, and God bless.